I have this um, ex ask the experts roses about roses on the screen right now, just as an intro. Um, I do want to take that off so you can see the lovely faces of our panelists, and then I will introduce our panelists. Um, we have with us right now um, Alex Charay and Delilah Onafrey. So I am going to let both of you introduce yourselves. Um, let's see here. Deli well, no, Alec, alphabetically by first name, you're first. So Alec, I will let you introduce yourself and your company and then we'll switch over to Delilah. Well, thank, thank you. And I've been using that ploy with my name for a long time to get in the front of the line all the time. So uh, thank you for keeping the tradition strong. <laughs> Um, hello, everybody. It's good to be with you. Uh, my name is Alex Shrey. I'm the Chief Marketing and Product Development Officer at Bailey Nurseries. Uh, Bailey Nurseries is located in uh, the upper Midwest, up in the Twin Cities area of Minnesota. Uh, we, uh, we are uh, plant breeders and growers, and I'll do all those good things. And Easy Elegance Roses is one of our brands, so I'm sure we'll be talking a little bit, a little bit about that today. Uh, so very, very happy to be here to talk about roses and gardening. Great. Okay. Um, next alphabetically is Delilah. Hi, I'm Delilah with Suntory Flowers. I'm marketing director in charge of our marketing activities in North America. Um, shrub roses are actually a relatively newer direction for us. We have two lines. We have the more com compact disease resistant shrub rose called Sun Rosa, and we have a more full sized a you know, fragrant, fully double flower disease resistant line called Brenda Bella. So these are both through partnerships with um, you know, third party rose breeders. In fact, um, the Sun Rosa line is from Dr. Keith Zari, who's um, from Jackson and Perkins fame. And then we have John Gray in Australia, he and his wife Sylvia, who have um, a nursery. And he's actually a plant pathologist that had driven to bring fragrance back to roses and while well, keeping the disease resistance. So we've, you know, for four years now, um, been marketing the line in North America. Okay, great. Uh, one other quick, no, two housekeeping tips. Um, if you go up to the upper right area where it says view and put it on speaker view, um, you'll have a little bit better experience because then the person who is speaking will be large on screen and um, it just makes it a little bit better. The other thing is in the um, chat, I see some people have already put some questions there. So that's great. I will ask them, um, but do post any questions that you have there and we will get to them. And um, I think what I would like to do is start with, I know there's different types of roses. And so maybe if both of you can um, kind of talk about the different roses that your company uh, breeds in, works with, et cetera, um, there's many different types and that would probably be a great way to get started. So let's, uh, Delilah, you're on screen, so I'll let you go first, and then we'll flip back to Alex. We, we're really good about sharing who goes first. Okay, so um, so our two lines that I mentioned, so the Sun Rosa is a very compact, smaller flowered one. It, it's, it doesn't like spread like a drift, it pretty much stays put. And, um, and then the Brenda Bella is you know, more, yeah, you know, the full sized shrub rose, you know, full body, full flowers, and, um, so one thing um, yeah, the breeder John Gray mentioned is that historically we've always had hybrid teas, floribundas, grandiflora, ground covers, climbers. So rose societies created all these subcategories to compare it, evaluate, and judge. But um, a lot of breeding has gone on, you know, mixing the different classes to get you know the modern roses we know today. Excellent. Um, Alec, before I switch over to you, I see that we have our third panelist, Tim. Welcome, welcome, welcome. I apologize, technology. Uh, Zoom picked uh, as we were entering the meeting to update and wouldn't let me in. So oh my goodness, I, I hate when that happens, that. but that's okay. 
um, you're, we're only seven minutes in, so that's good. So Tim, I'm going to let you introduce yourself and then you might as well just jump right into the different types of roses that Star Roses um, works in. And then we'll go back to Alec. So take it away, Tim. Great. Uh, my name is Tim Wood. I'm with Star Roses and Plants. I've uh, been with the Star Roses and Plants for 19 years now. Um, we are one of the premier breeders uh, and distributors of roses in the industry. Uh, we are the people who work with Will Radler to develop and release uh, um, the knockout family of roses, as well as the dripped family of roses. Uh, we have a long history. This is actually our 125th anniversary uh, this year, and uh, we are the people that are responsible for the Peace Rose, for Madeline Roses, uh, for the first shrub rose to win a uh, a uh, double ARS award, which was uh, 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 Bonica. So we've been around a, a long time. We have a very, uh, we have a vested interest in roses and, and a long history in it. Fantastic. And just for clarification, you had said AARS um, and one of the organizations that we uh, run here in our office is AAS, which is All America Selections, not the Rose right. Selections, two different organizations. And I believe AARS actually is going by a different name now, right? Yes. And I couldn't tell you what that name is off the top of my head. Well, there's been so many, so many changes in the in the in those in the groups that are judging and uh, evaluating roses. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But they're still doing the same thing. So they trial roses, whereas our organization here trials everything other than roses, basically. <laughs> but I, I'm glad you brought that up because that that gave us a chance to explain. So okay, now I think we're going to toss back to Alec. Well, I suppose we should talk about roses because I could start talking about how we're 117 year, years old, so not quite as old as you are, Tim. <laughs> but, but anyway, um, I think the question was just the different types of roses, and I think that's a topic that can easily pull people down a rabbit hole pretty quick, and it gets confusing really fast, and so uh, uh, I'll do my best to give a fairly straightforward answer as best I can. Um Many years ago, when I was a kid and my grandmother was was rose gardening and, and doing her thing, um, uh, the, the common way to get roses, those big, beautiful blooms and those big, long stems were the traditional hybrid tea roses. Um, the majority of those, in fact, 99% of those roses were, were budded, which is basically taking the good characteristics of of the genetics uh, on that rose plant um, that, that we all adore, and then putting it on a root system that was more aggressive so that the plant could ultimately perform. Um, many of those big, beautiful blooms uh, take energy away from the root system on some of those varieties, and, and especially back then. And so it was very difficult to, to do anything but get budded roses. And uh, you might hear them called garden roses. You can hear them called a lot of different things. It, it, it turns into a, a, a big old confusing thing. But so much has changed in, in breeding and development um, uh, over, over really the last 20 years. Um, you know, our Easy Elegance line, Tim, your line as well, and, and are, are very focused now on, on bringing what are called shrub, hardy shrub roses to the marketplace, which are in many cases taking those those characteristics of those beautiful hybrid tea flowers, those floribundas, um, you know, which are slightly smaller blooms, but still more of them, grandifloras, big, large flowers, and 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 and, and taking all of those and and put um, uh, doing the breeding work so that really uh, ultimately we're turning the the rose industry is turning um, what used to be challenging gardening into easy gardening, um, where you're able to now enjoy. A, a, a shrub rose no differently than you can enjoy a hardy shrub of any kind really um, and I think that's one of the the most exciting things that's happened really in, in that period of time is is there's just so many colors and, and sizes and shapes and and different uh, shrub roses out there now they're just so much easier to grow uh, that you don't we, we don't have to be rose gardeners anymore to enjoy roses we can treat them if you want a rose garden great you can do that but if you just simply want to add a little pop of color into your landscape uh, there's plenty of options now to do that okay it's it's almost like i 
unplugged you to, to say that because one of the things I was going to ask all three of you is um, you guys are doing amazing work across the board in bringing out a lot of new varieties. And I know Delilah, you mentioned um, scent. Uh, I think all the breeders now are saying, you know, because traditionally that's that's what everybody thinks of back in grandma's garden was smelling the roses. And so you're working on that. You're working on some other things to make it easier. Do each one of you want to talk about some of those things that um, as a breeding company you're working on in order to make gardeners more successful? Oh, okay. Yeah. So um, the disease resistance would be number one, the cleanliness of the foliage, but even though that's, you know, that is, you know, exciting to people as the flowers, but it really makes or breaks how good a rose is going to be, how, how clean that foliage is. Um, the, the common complaints are you know, black spot and mildew. So disease resistance, which, you know, definitely I think knockout they led the way on that one. And um, so with Brenda Bella, that breeder is a plant pathologist. So disease resistance first, and also like the body of the plant. So it's not like a couple of twigs or sticks. So you get this full bush and also flower form and fragrance. So disease resistance is incredibly important to us. Uh, we, and thank you, we, we, we feel we've led the way with, with, with the knockout family of roses, drift roses. One of the things that we've been working on for the last 15 years plus is bringing that, those level of genetics, those level of disease resistance into garden roses, into traditional hybrid teas, grandifloras. Um, and more importantly, uh, or just as importantly, developing uh, garden roses that are hybrid teas, grandifloras that will grow on their own roots. So they have to remove the budded aspect so that uh, on, an, on an own root rose, if it freezes to the ground, it's going to come back true to form. So your red hybrid tea that's own root is going to come back as a red hybrid tea as opposed to, as opposed to the root stock. So that's an area that we have been been actively actively breeding in and and uh, uh, improving. And as you can see behind me, Sentables is is a a line of our our best garden rose genetics hybrid teas. And this this is a, a focus on fragrance as well. Uh, so that is the the disease resistance absolutely is there. The hardiness we're working on zone four hardiness as much as possible, which uh, Bailey's has been phenomenal with over the over the years. Um, um, and then again, disease resistance, fragrance, and getting Grandma's Rose own root and to a point where we don't have black spot on, on it anymore. It has leaves in August, um, and it will be reliable for the for the for the average gardener, and they can feel they could plant it where where they plant a knockout. In the front landscape, in the right in the normal garden, and not have to worry about its appearance in August or September. Tim is very nice to say that we're great at the, the northern breeding. Well, by gosh, we better be. We're in Minnesota. <laughs> we we have about two months of growing season. So, <laughs> uh, no, thank you. Um, yeah, I, I think that you're going to hear a lot of uh, you know even throughout this next forty five minutes. You're probably going to hear us talk a lot about disease resistance. I think it's just going to be a common thing because it's really been one of those things in in breeding that if you don't have plants that look good in the garden when plants aren't in full bloom, uh, it's, it's just not a desirable trait. Um, and when it comes to uh, specifically some of the things that we work on in addition to that, uh, Tim brought up the, the cold tolerance and the cold hardiness uh, with the Easy Elegance line. Um, you know, that's something that's real. And, and I think that, you know, a, a lot of the genetics I, I talked about um, early on in the, in the session here about those, those hybrid T types, those beautiful blooms, things like that. It was always that sore spot that you, you had to take those old fashioned roses uh, that were budded and, and which means they were, they were grown differently than today's shrub roses. Uh, you would have to take that plant and you'd actually have to bury it in the ground in a, in a method called the Minnesota tip. That's what we called it. And, and you basically have to go through this process. And I think for a lot of people, it just got to be exhausting and it got to feel dated. And, and we just felt like this is just, isn't the payoff really isn't there. Uh, or, or, or if you're probably like me, I, I, I never had to do it, thankfully, but I'm sure, I'm sure as heck 
certain if I would have buried one of those roses, I would have never remembered where I buried it. So that's that's probably part of the deal too. Um, so when we to getting getting back to the genetics and the breeding that's going on in the rose industry, um, it's perfectly plausible now to have hardy plants that can survive cold zone four winters that will that will survive like a shrub um, and be reliable and I think in the case of our breeding with easy elegance uh, you know I've had plants in my garden where the foliage still stands strong and the blooms are still coming until the that very last breath of, of fall when we start to get a freeze and and that's that's really critical. Um, you know, there, we, you need plants to look good from beginning till the end of the season. So, when you hear the word disease resistance from us, it can have a variable meaning. But I think overall, we're all focused on bringing really healthy plants to the garden. Yeah, good point. Um, so, okay, I'm going to go ahead and ask this question, and then I'm going to bump up our pest and disease question from the end to the beginning because that's the question everybody has but what I want to know is okay I'm I'm a homeowner I'm a gardener and I'm like oh wow okay I'm really inspired by roses how do I decide which one I mean what what do I have to look at um my soil type the sun exposure where it is the amount of space I have maybe Maybe talk a little bit about how I make a decision on which grow, which rows to even ask for or look for. You know, first thing that I would look at is the sun exposure. All roses are going to need six or more hours of sunlight, preferably afternoon. But you know, they'll take morning. They they will thrive in morning sun, afternoon shade, as long as you have six or more hours of sunlight. So that's the first thing that I'm going to that I'm going to look at. It's got to be a sunny spot. Uh, the next thing I'm I, I want to look at is what what's the purpose? Are you looking for cut roses? Are you looking for uh, a shrub rose that's gonna that that's gonna take a lot of wind? Is gonna bloom constantly? Disease resistance, resistance, so on. What what's the purpose that you're uh, that that you're wanting to plant that rose? So that's that's kind of the, the 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 first couple of things that I'm looking at. Roses are very very soil tolerant. They don't like wet feet, but they will they will tackle heavy clay soils. They do well in sandy soils. Uh, uh, they 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 are very adaptable. Um, but as long as you can get them six hours of sunlight, and again, you're not planting them in a space that's too confined for them, you should be very successful. So at that point, it's kind of a utility. Why why what are you looking for in that rose? I would wholeheartedly agree with that. Couldn't say it much better. Um, I, I, I'll add a couple other things for consideration beyond the garden. Um, I think, um, you know, there's a lot of plants out there that, that, that can be used in other ways outside of just being in the garden. There are plenty of roses that are beautiful in decorative containers. And I think that that's something that, that, that people don't always think about when you're shopping in the store and you're thinking about, you know, picking up that rose, you're probably thinking about a project or you're thinking about a spot in the garden, but uh, there's a lot of beautiful roses that are wonderfully enjoyed in a patio or on a terrace somewhere. Um, and if you're choosing varieties like that, I would be looking more towards what are called ever blooming types rather than recurrent blooming types. Uh, there is a bit of a difference between, and us, us rose geeks start to, you know, use our lingo on you, and, and that can be confusing sometimes, but ever blooming means, generally speaking, the rose is always going to have a flower on it in some phase of the season. Um, it, it, it may take a slight break, potentially, but really the intention is to have pretty much repeat flowers throughout the growing season, whereas if you ever see the word recurrent on a label, that can vary. Some of those rose genetics might have one or two flower periods through the season, maybe two, three, or four, but they generally take a break in between each one to re reset their flower buds and have color again. So if you're thinking about whether it's for the garden and ever blooming is important to you, or even in a container, I, that would, that would be something I'd be thinking about. And you know, thinking about specifically about container gardening, I'd also be looking then for plants that are generally smaller in stature, um, ones that are more compact, um, uh, just so that you can, you know, not having something unruly on your patio. Great tips. Yes, thank you. Um, okay, I think we have to just jump to black spot. That's there's a lot of questions here about black spot. We've already talked about it. Um, 
And, you know, I, I realize that what's happening is people have older variety of roses in their yard and they are going to put everything into keeping them healthy. Um, but, okay, so if I have black spot on my roses and it's an older variety that I want to keep, what should I do? You want to... <laughs> Uh, there's I can always open my big mouth, but I'm just trying to be respectful. <laughs> exactly. Uh, you know, there are a lot of products that can be used for, for black spot. Um, there are some, some granular products that would be put on early in the season. Um, one of the, if you're, if, if it's an older rose and you're trying to maintain it, uh, black spot needs to be treated as the leaves are emerging in the spring. And it's typically when, you know, when, when it's raining, when, when the weather conditions are, are at its worst to go out and have to apply a fungicide of some type. But that's really when you need to, uh, need to apply and treat for black spot. Um, so if you're, if you're very much attached to that rose, then that's when you're going to need to, uh, to do the treatment on it. Uh, as the leaves fall off, remove the leaves from the ground. Don't allow them to, to lie on the ground. That's a, uh, the spores will overwinter and uh, on those leaves. So try and make sure you're really cleaning up uh, in the fall or even, you know, in the summer as well when, uh, when, they, when they defoliate. Um, and if you're not overly attached to that rose, buy a newer rose, buy an improved <laughs> rose, a newer variety that's very disease resistant. Uh, along with that treatment, uh, I would also say uh, if, if you have a variety that you love and you're trying to keep it healthy and, and, and all the things that Tim brought up about treatment from a fung fungicide application are spot on. Uh, also make sure that, that the plant's not crowded in the garden and allow it the, the ability to have some air movement so that uh, the foliage can remain as dry as possible and, and uh, that will also uh, potentially help a little bit. So I'm assuming the same advice um, with a lot of garden varieties is water in the morning or drip irrigation. Don't water at night because it will encourage it. Is that true or not true? Very true. Yeah, make sure you're watering in the morning, early enough in the afternoon that it's going to dry before uh, before we get dark. Uh, you need a certain amount of time of moisture on the leaf for those spores to germinate. So you want to make sure that you're watering early enough so that the plant dries off. And as Alex said, a lot, you know, good airflow. Don't don't pack them in. Allow for good for good air exchange and and uh, um, keep them dry at night. Okay. Um, so we have some questions um, on pest. Also, somebody says, I have six road bush rose bushes that have been invaded by beetles. I'm assuming Japanese beetles, not sure. Um, I pick them off. Anything else I can do? Question mark. Well, yeah, uh, you can, I mean, you can use, um, certainly there are uh, over the counter, off the shelf um, insects, insecticides. If if that's something that, that you want to use, the, the the issue with something like a Japanese beetle is generally you have to use a product that is non-selective, uh, meaning generally the insecticide is going to kill other beneficial insects in addition to the insect you're trying to kill. Uh, so it's not to say that you can't use it. I mean, if you use the product safely and as directed, and you keep it specific to to your your issue. And you don't just go and spray your entire flower garden with it, then you know that's perfectly legitimate. Um, uh, uh, just use it more as a as a, a focused control uh, for the interval that's been been, been suggested, and then and then move on. Um, um, otherwise, there are there are other organic um, uh, methods as well uh, that I'm not nearly as versed on. If some if there's another panelist that is, that's that's certainly helpful. Um, you know, things like insecticidal soap or, uh, you know, a neem oil or, or things like that could be used. But I think they're, you know, the Japanese beetle are, are not, you know, they're, they're, they're pretty tough. Um, you know, there's other, there's also traps that you can use for Japanese beetles and, and hang traps in your garden and things like that too. So um, I don't know if that was specific enough, but that's uh, maybe gets the ball rolling. Well, is um, I just made the assumption that it was Japanese beetles. Are there other beetles that attack roses, or is it you know kind of different climates, geographic areas have different beetle issues? 
there's there's there are several of the white grub type beetles, chafer beetle, and a few other. And um, I would also add to to to, uh, to Alec. Um, this is going to sound a little crazy, but there's also a good argument of doing nothing and allowing them to feed. And, and by that, what I, what I mean is the years that we, I, I personally had those, those infestations and, and seen them in landscapes and so on. That fall, late summer, that fall, when, when the plant flushes back out again, those have been some of the most phenomenal reblooming periods for those, for those plants. You have clean foliage, the, the foliage isn't tired. You've got brand new energy from those, from those leaves and you're just gonna have a, you typically are gonna have a great fall blooming season. So I'm actually kind of an advocate of letting them chew. It's not gonna hurt the plant. They've already built up a lot of their, a lot of their nutrients that they needed uh, from spring and then they're gonna reflush again and you're gonna have a great flower show in the fall. Or move up to Minnesota where we get nice and cold and it kills all the beetles in the winter anyway. That could also be an option. <laughs> yeah, every region has its benefits, right? <laughs> I like the idea of uh, just letting Mother Nature go and uh, letting the beetles do your pruning and other stuff and mm -hmm. strong will survive, right? Yep. Okay, so there's another question then about saw flies. Um, saw flies have turned my leaves to windows. Is it okay to remove these skeleton leaves or am I doing more damage to my plant by removing those leaves? Should I leave them on for photosynthesis? I would say it depends on the percentage that, uh, of the, of the damage. If it's, if it's, you know, 70% of the leaves, which typically on saw fly, it's not, um, then you're going to want to leave what you, what you have there to try and, you know, to, to give energy to the plant. Um, if it's a handful, go ahead and remove those and they'll, they'll go ahead and flush back out again. And what about, uh, the saw flies? Is it kind of a similar thing? Um, leave them be, they're not going to do that much damage, pick them off. What's the control? solution the soft, soft flies are, ve are very very specific window of time and it's a very short period of time they typically don't do that much damage so we get calls um and lots of you know questions about them i really don't do anything for them um i kind of let them do their thing um they're there and they're gone and you'll also notice around that time they'll also be um, some transitory beetles that come in the feed at night. You'll see some holes in the leaves and you're not going to find an insect, uh, no matter how hard you look because they're feeding, they're feeding at night and then they're moving on. So it's one of those things that I kind of leave it alone, but they, they do offer treatments for it. You can, at your local garden center, you can buy some, some, some systemic insecticides, but again, anything that's, that's sprayed, that's non-selective can also damage beneficials as well. And I'm looking at the three of you, and I think we have a really good representation on uh, some different areas of the country, right? Alec, you're up north in Minnesota. Delilah, you're Ohio. Tim, I assume you're on the East Coast? I'm not. I'm actually in Ohio. Is oh, you're in Ohio <laughs> also. Okay. Well, then we don't have a really good, uh, <laughs> we're very Midwestern focused. So if anybody um, as an attendee here has questions on some things from other areas, toss them out. We'll see if we can answer them. Our propagation partners in Florida, so we do a lot of selection or for heat tolerance. So basically, if it doesn't do well in Florida, we're not going to introduce it. So we've developed the following in the South for that reason. Um, so that, and yeah, like Dr. Alan Armitage in Georgia, you know, has trialed them too. <laughs> and um, yeah. so, yeah, but yeah, the regional trials we talked about before. Um, so AARS is now AGRS, I believe. And then there's the ARTS. So that's, yeah, so that those have been useful to get all the climate results and regional um, performance. Great. Alec, did you have something else to add? Diane, I was just going to piggyback on and try to put a ribbon and bow on soft flies a little bit because uh, I just noticed that there was a, a, a question in addition in the chat about skeletonized leaves and if it's okay to remove those. And yes, um, no problem. You're not going to hurt a thing. You can always give your, you, you can, that's the beauty of roses. You can always give them a little trim anytime you want. Um, if you want to do a little selective trim so you don't remove a flower bud, fine. 
Um, if it's a if it's an ever blooming or a, a variety or a, just a, a shrub rose in general, uh, you can many times just give them a light trim overall in the entire plant too if you wanted to. And, and most varieties have the ability to to reflower, so you won't be hurting nothing. Excellent. Okay. Do we want to talk about rose rosette disease? Sure. Tell, tell us what it is. Tell us what to do. It's probably part of your breeding now is trying to uh, breed some that are less susceptible, I'm assuming. Absolutely. Um, there, Rose rosette disease is a virus that is transmitted through the, uh, a mite called the aeropoid mite. Um, the, the natural host of this particular virus is uh, Rosa multiflora, which if you're aware of that variety is kind of a weed. It's kind of a uh, uh, peripheral type plant that grows in uh, under, understory areas and in ditches and so on. Um, so this, 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 this virus is transmitted by the airfoid mite. The airfoid mite does not fly. It doesn't crawl. It balloons. So it, it blows through, through the air and happens to land on a rose, or actually there's, there's multiple crops that the aerofoid mite can, can, can feed on as well. Um, once the virus is in the plant, um, there is not a treatment for it. Um, it, 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 it creates what's considered a, what called a witch's broom. So you'll see a lot of, of thick thorns, big thick red foliage, and uh, kind of a, a, a broom type appearance on the, on the new growth of the plant. Um, we do know that the amount of rosa, ro rose rosette disease in an area is directly related to the amount of rosa multiflora that is growing wild within the area as well. So it's, a kind of, it, it, it's something that we've watched over the last 40 years or so, I believe. It's, it's, it, it, it's transitory and kind of a bell curve type type thing. You'll have it. It'll be intense for three to four years. Ro the rose rosette virus will destroy the rose and multiflora that's in the it, that's growing wild in the area. The virus will go away again for another ten or fifteen years until the amount of rose and multiflora that's growing wild will start to build back up again. Um, and it's this cycle that continues. We see it heavily in the, in the, in the Mid-South region, so Kentucky, Tennessee, Virginia, uh, Missouri, Kansas, those areas. Uh, it's, it's, it's very prevalent. I've seen it as far as Michigan. Uh, I've seen it up in Wisconsin. The airfoid mite is very hardy, so cold isn't an issue. They found it up in, up in Alberta. Uh, one thing that we do know about this, and, and the more that I've seen it over the last 10 years, I'm more convinced than ever about it. This is more a maintenance issue than, than an issue or a plague of roses with a virus. We do know that the mite overwinters in the, in, the, in the top portion of the plant. We do know that if the mite hits the ground or is removed from the plant, it's gonna die in 48 hours. Again, it doesn't crawl, it doesn't fly. It hits the ground, it's lost its feeding source, it's, it, it's done. We know that if you trim the top third portion of the plant, you're removing overwintering mites. And you're gonna greatly reduce the propensity and the, the chance of getting rose, rose, or rose rosette disease on other plants uh, or on other roses. This virus the, and, the, and the mite moves very slowly and methodically. Um, there's an amusement park in Cincinnati. It's a, called Cedar Point. About eight years ago, uh, I got a call from one of their from one of their landscape uh, one of their head nursery people to come up and look. They had knockouts planted throughout the entire the entire midway. Slowly but surely, over about a three year period, row after row was getting this weird weird disease. But it wasn't something that took out the entire fairway in one season. This this was something that took three to four years before we finally removed it, and found out that yes, this was rose rosette disease. And there in Sandusky, Ohio, there is a plethora of Rosa multiflora and all around the park. So it was just best that we removed knockout for that period of time. But again, not something that came in. We're talking hundreds of roses, took them three years and it was a methodical row after row of, of knockout that slowly, slowly was infected. And, and then it, you know, it affected other, other roses that were there, there as well. But again, very slow, very methodical. So getting it in there, getting it into your garden isn't the end of all the roses. You don't have to dig up every, every rose and get rid of it. I would recommend that you remove the one that's showing active symptoms uh, and make sure you're trimming. Make sure you trim in the spring. Cut back the, the plant by a third, if not two thirds. 
And, and, and you don't always have to be pretty on how you trim it back. I, I take my knockouts, my shrub roses, I cut it back to about six inches and it's not, it's not pretty, <laughs> but they flush, they do great. And we don't have the incidence of rose rosette disease. And there's a, a study that was sponsored with the landscape uh, company and slip in my mind now in Virginia. Um, and they were looking at uh, insecticidal type control versus maintenance controls. And they saw a significant decrease in the amount of rose rosette disease that in their, in their area simply based on, on trimming and trimming, uh, trimming alone. That's very interesting. I, I hadn't explored the topic. I always thought that you had to get rid of the rose. So you don't, it's a matter of good maintenance, good trimming, good pruning. Well, I, I will say if you, if you have it in there, uh, you're going to want to remove that particular rose, but you don't need to remove all the roses around it. The one that's symptomatic, there, there is some anecdotal evidence of if you catch it early enough, trim it back to the bot, to the base and, and it may not get, you know, moved throughout the plant. I can't tell you that's, that's going to, that's going to be the fact I've heard, I've heard that thrown out. I would say on that particular plant, just re remove the one that's infected. And, and if you don't, you're not seeing it on the other roses, chances are, you're not going to, you're not going to have it. Make sure you're trimming in the spring. If you're doing that you're going to greatly reduce the amount of uh, incidences or potential of uh, spreading rose rosette disease. Awesome information. Um, do you have a source? I mean, because really it's identification by this little broom type appearance um, where it puts out extra foliage, right? Do you have a good recommendation or do you have a link we can put in the chat that would show a rose with rose rosette disease? Uh, there, there actually is. I believe if you uh, look up roserosette.org, there is a, uh, a, a, a national nursery group that we've all kind of come together. Bailey's is a part of it. I believe Centauri is a part of it as well, where we've we've uh, uh, funded research into it. And yes, it's active going research to try and find uh, uh, varieties that are going to be resistant or breed resistance into those particular varieties. Okay. Um, well, I think that's a perfect segue to talk about pruning. Oh, good. Gail just found it. She put it in the chat. Perfect. Thank you, Gail. Um, but maybe each one of you want to take a little bit uh, part about pruning. Uh, what time of year is it different for different types of roses? Somebody specifically says, I have a carpet rose that's five feet high. Can I prune it down? Um, somebody else is asking about deadheading, um, and then we're going to talk a little bit about um, the the logistics of growing soil and fertilizer and stuff like that. But uh, who wants to, who wants to first tackle pruning and deadheading? Well, so um, so our breeder John Gray he says annual pruning in the winter is all that's required. Cut two thirds of the bush away in shape to a rounded form and don't get too fussy he even uses a hedge trimmer so it sounds like people are afraid to get aggressive and yeah just like what from what tim was saying it sounds like you can get really aggressive cutting back as long as those roots are good so. <laughs> yeah everybody's always afraid to um harm by pruning and it is surprising so did you say cut two a third or cut a third two thirds off. two thirds of the bush away okay but, and i know so we have brenda bellas um alongside our porch at home like the purple prince we've got four years now and they're like five feet tall and my husband does cut them back you know significantly every year and then you know they rebound so i i think cutting back aggressively is a good idea and did you say winter or late winter or spring, sorry. Okay, so the, since the breeder's in Australia, he says winter, so it'd be um, when there's no, probably no danger of frost, <laughs> I would think you know, yeah, early spring. Okay, Alec, what about your experience being in a northern colder climate? When, when do you recommend pruning? Well, if we're talking about shrub roses, um, which I'm going to assume that we are, then, then I would agree that there, there's a lot to that. I think the other thing about uh, about pruning, because there's pruning when you're when you're trying to really aggressively prune to maintain shape or improve vigor to get the plants to to to, to actively grow. 
that's one thing. There's also pruning after the winter season. You know, there's inevitably going to be uh, parts of the rose bush that's going to have some dead stems. Uh, we also call them canes. If you ever hear but talk, people talking about a rose cane, it's the same thing as a stem. Again, we like to throw lingo out there for some reason. Sorry, everybody. Um, but but um, if, if there's a, you know, it, it, the kind of the rule of thumb is you can either, um, you can wait to see what's actively growing and, and let the plant after winter, you can let the rose bush start to leaf out. And then once you see um, leaves emerge, you'll know what, what stems didn't survive that winter and you can prune then or generally it's pretty easy to tell because the stem will be basically brown, whereas the, the stems that are truly um, still actively alive uh, are, are more green in color. Um, so, so I think that, that can just be some maintenance that, that can happen from time to time because you know that, that level of pruning after winter will depend on what type of rose you have, how, how hardy that rose bush is, for the climate um, but even even the hardiest plants have a bad winter sometimes and you have to just realize that uh, that's just part of the part of the deal um, so um, that that would just be something that I would recommend just just going out every spring and just taking a look at uh, how things are looking and removing that 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 dead material uh, to limit disease um, limit wounds from from further further uh, insect or um, fungal pests is, is probably good and when, when you are pruning Make sure you got nice sharp pruners and you're taking straight cuts so that you're not leaving any openings or wounds for, for those uh, those pests to, to get in. Excellent. Okay, so the dead canes, do you cut them down to where, like as far possible as you can cut them? Do you leave like two inches? What's the recommendation? Yeah, so like if, if, if this is a cane, right? And if, if, this, if, if, if it's dead here, but the next branch is here, I cut just above that branch. If that makes any sense so yes um you don't want to leave a little nub because okay. that's just going to dry up and be another opening for for a, for a wound so you want to try to have a nice smooth cut right next to the to the to the lowest bud or the lowest stem of that rose bush i'm just curious how do all of you guys um disinfect your pruners hmm. <laughs> Is it, is it inappropriate to say scotch? I won't say that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's one of those things that um, a lot of people forget to do. Mm. Not talking about myself, I disinfect after every use, right? Yeah. Um, so is, is there any good little tips that you have? I mean, do you just carry around alcohol wipes? Do you carry around a spray with you and use it? after you're, you've done your pruning? Alcohol wipes are, 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 a, are a good tool if you have them, though. I, I, we, we preach it, but I can tell you in my landscape, I'm not the best at, at, at sterilizing on a regular basis. And uh, at, at, at growers, at nurseries, it's a little bit different when you're talking you know, tens of thousands of roses and the propensity to spread disease that way. Um, yes, you should be, uh, I saw somebody put Lysol spray, make sure you wipe, you know, you don't want that, you want it running, but then you want to wipe it clean, alcohol wipes, um, a bleach water mixture as well to dip in, uh, would be fine. And then when you're done pruning the roses, you know, go ahead and clean up the, uh, the pruners then as well. Don't put them away, uh, away dirty whenever possible. I think that's probably the biggest thing. If we, I think I, I, I tend to be, even though I work in this business and I have for a long time when I'm at home. Now I'm working in my yard. There's only so much routine and, and so much uh, process I'm going to allow my life to have. And, and um, you know, keeping things clean, I think, just in general uh, is the best practice um, rather than trying to go through a painstaking exercise of, of trying to disinfect every time you cut your rows and then move on to the next one. That, if, you, if you can do it, if you want to do it, no, no harm in it. But that's, that's, that's where it starts to get a little bit chaotic for me. Thank you. You made me feel better now. <laughs> um, we were we were talking about some of the diseases, uh, pests earlier, and somebody was asking about aphids on their roses. I forgot to include that earlier. Somebody want to address aphids? Do we leave them alone? Are they really going to do that much harm? Well, actually, 
aphids can spread uh, mosaic virus if uh, if you would happen to have a rose that was infected with mosaic in in the area. So it is good to treat uh, when you when you see them. Actually, a really good spray from the a strong spray from the hose uh, tends to knock them off and damage them as well. Um, and intends to take care of that. Same thing with spider mites as well. Uh, so that's actually a pretty basic and easy, easy way to help control them. Uh, insecticidal soap is phenomenal as well. Very easy to use and very, very safe and friendly. Excellent. Okay, let's talk about um, just some basic growing things. I, I heard one of you say that they're pretty tolerant of different soil types. Um, so that's great. But what about fertilizer? I, I, you know, the newer roses are, are, do they not need it because they're just bred to be florific flowers, bloomers, um, or do, do the newer ones still need some sort of fertilizer and then maybe address older varieties? Do they need more fertilizer or, or just talk, talk to our audience about more blooms? <laughs> Spring fertilizer with a granular fertilizer is is the probably the best way to go. There's a there's there's many slow release fertilizers that can that can be put out. Um, in you know the most important thing with it is making sure that once we get to the Fourth of July, uh, and again depending on the region that you're in, but in the Midwest, Fourth of July is really kind of the last time you want to going to want to put a fertilizer application down, especially something like the the like knockouts. They're very aggressive. They want to bloom. They want to continue flowering, continue growing. They don't like to shut down and, and harden off, as we call it, for winter. So it's very important to pull back the, uh, the fertilizer uh, on, on varieties like that and allow them to naturally slow down and uh, uh, get ready for winter and, and, and harden off and be able to handle the cold. I would also suggest the pruning goes along with the fertilization mm -hmm. as well and not you know, once you get late in the season, Pat, in, into that early August time frame, that's when a real aggressive pruning should stop. Nothing wrong with removing a flower bud or a spent bloom or th something like that, but I would just leave pruning alone until the plant drops all of its leaves and truly goes dormant uh, so that you're simply just not trying to keep that plant from thinking it needs to continue to grow and grow and grow yep. until that frost comes. So for fertilizer, our reader, he um, recommends an NPK ratio 10 for 10, a handful every six weeks. And that his rule of thumb is when you see a flush of flowers, then apply fertilizer for the next flush. And that's what he does. Okay. So fertilize early in the spring and early summer, but then back off so that it starts to go through its natural cycle of shutting down for fall and winter. Okay, that's good. Same way with pruning then. Good tips. Um, so what might be wrong with my rose if the leaves start turning yellow? Where on the plant are they turning yellow? That's the, that's the other question. Is it inside? Is it on the tips? There's, there, there's multiple things that it could be. Uh, a rose that has been through drought, um, need, needed water, hot, dry, didn't get the water. Typically you'll see yellowing on the inside and maybe a defoliation of the inside leaves. Um, and, and whereas something that might be a nutrient issue might, would, would be more of a yellowing on the, on, on the tips. Sorry, I'm writing this down so we can post it later. <laughs> okay, so um, a drought would cause yellowing on the inner foliage, but a nutrient deficiency of some sort yeah. would be yellowing on the tips. Are you? Yeah. Oops, sorry about that. It was. When Diane turns her head, I think we have the same glasses because it's got a thing on the oh. side. Okay. <laughs> so, you know, um, yeah, for yellowing, um, yeah, our breeder John says look at water availability first. If it's the lower leaves, it's not usually a long term issue, but if it's the top leaves, you might need some expert help. Okay. The other thing with yellowing, and not to like, I mean, I think the, the core of the question has been answered here. Yellowing can also be a symptom of virus, um, but usually the yellowing is much different looking than 
a moisture issue like we're talking about here. Normally it's going to be a little bit more splotchy. There's going to be a little bit of a mix of green and yellow and the leaf and something like that. So I only bring it up because it is a possibility, but really it is a generally a watering issue, I would say. So one of the, uh, this question came up um, earlier that I wanted to ask you guys um, in terms of yellow leaves, in terms of the rose rosette, um, in terms of any other issues, we like to always say to you know, our constituents is go to your local extension office, go to your local garden center. Um, yeah, you can go online, but you might go down a rabbit hole and it's very regional specific sometimes, you know, if we're having a drought in Chicago, but they're getting way too much rain in Portland, you know, you can't just get a general answer from, in general terms, the website. So do you guys have any other recommendations? Do you have help desks um, through your website or what, what other tips would you give people for really properly identifying any issues with their roses? recommend going to your to your to your local garden center those are the experts those are the those are the people that uh, know the area and are very experienced with the the conditions extension as well uh but again your local your local garden center is there is there to help you and they've probably already seen it and can can help you and they have the ability and the products to help to, to help treat the issue you you asked about if we had a help desk or something and i, and I don't say this to make a plug uh, for for easy elegance in any shape or form although i am a shameless marketer i understand um but we do have um easy elegance does have a, a mobile what we call a mobile support program where you, um, where you can subscribe uh, and get care information from easy elegance and it's tailored to your region of the country and it's it's uh, it's so if you're wondering when to water or when to prune in general times of year, uh, we'll deliver information like that. You can, it, it, that information is on the, the back of the plant take. So you know if you are if folks on the call were interested in a, you know that kind of support, it is out there. It's not a replacement for the garden center and the extension. I think those those are the 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 fundamental first steps when it comes to diagnosing a specific issue. But if you're looking for just general ideas and how to take care of things, there are resources like that out there. And you mentioned plant tags. I, I think you guys should kind of talk a little bit about plant tags because it's wonderful information. And I mean, roses have pretty big plant tags. It's not a little bitty pixie tag like an annual will have. Let the marketer. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right. <laughs> Well, so I'm sorry, I guess I would miss, were we supposed to comment on plant tags? <laughs> well, is there anything else you would like to add um, that people should pay attention to? Because one of the things um, that we briefly mentioned earlier is spacing, you know, not to crowd them. So mm -hmm. I'm assuming spacing um, suggestions are on the plant tag. What, what else is on there that people should really be paying attention to other than the variety name? That's very, very important. They got to know what they're planting. Yeah, I mean, I think it's all those things, you know, how big does the plant get generally when it matures? Because it's when you're in the store and you look at this beautiful plant and you think, oh my gosh, it, look, at the, look at that red flowering plant and you bring it home and you realize, oh, I bought a, a vining rose. Oh my goodness gracious, now what do I do? And that's going to get 12 feet tall. So uh, just simple things, right? Uh, it's kind of like me going to a, a store in a, in a related category. I need just as much help uh, in different categories and so just look for general information whether it's you know exposure should be assumed that tim brought it up earlier on the call roses are full sun plants if you're planting them in light shade you're not going to get the performance um that's just where it's at so everything else in terms of size shape flower color uh, how often it should flower all of that kind of information should be prevalent on the label yeah fragrance, uh, fragrance. Kind of description of the fragrance as well correct correct Excellent. Um, so, oh, we only have a few minutes left. Okay. Um, I think it's time to uh, put you guys on the spot. And if you can name one favorite variety, I guess I might allow you two or maybe two colors of one variety. I just want to hear what you're passionate about and which, uh, which variety or which series is, is your favorite and why? 
So who wants to go first? You know something, Tim, we're going to let you go first because earlier we did the whole alphabetical thing. So now we're going to go reverse by first. <laughs> you win first name or last name. Sorry. <laughs> uh, one, of my, one of my personal favorites is a variety we introduced a few years ago called uh, Sunset Horizon. Uh, it's a Floribunda, but it has multiple, uh, multiple multiple colors on the on the on the on the flower starts out as a yellow but you'll have reds you'll have oranges you'll have a chimera of red and, and, and oranges and yellows so you're going to get a, a multitude of, of different colors and each one tends to be a little unique it's very it's very floriferous it's going to flower all summer long uh, it has really dark purple foliage so it, it's very attractive from, from a foliage standpoint. Then you've got these super bright flowers on top of it. Uh, very easy to grow, um, performs really well in zone five um, in, in the area south. Very clean, very disease resistant too. Uh, so it's gonna have its leaves on it in August and it's gonna flower all summer, summer long. So that's one of my personal favorites uh, um, that, that, that's really caught my eye of late. Okay, excellent. Um, then going backwards, Delilah. Yeah, so this was, um, so last year we planted um, at home the Brindabella Pink Princess, which is a sport of the Purple Prince. And um, so it, it has a really uh, like pretty, like almost like cake frosting, pink flower and old fashioned form. So that, that was one that was really capturing my attention this season. And then in our smaller sun roses, um, just I, I saw some trials last week in Santa Barbara and the orange delight. Um, so these are smaller flowers, but they still like with the temperature, they you see some hints of pink and yellow with the orange flowers. So you get the multi-dimensional color, even though it is a compact um, shrub rose. Okay. So I I hear both of you talking about some of the uh, variated colors. So that's mm -hmm. almost cheating because you don't have to pick one color, but that's yeah. quite all right. Because <laughs> I think that's a trend in a lot of breeding is bringing forth multiple colors in the same plant. So that's awesome. Now that kind of puts you on the spot, Alec. Are you a multiple color fan or are you a solid color fan? Now we need more time. Um, <laughs> um, I would say that of all the easy elegance roses we've grown for over the years, I keep going back to the richest red we have, which is a variety called cashmere. And it's just a, it's just a, I can't use that word. I can't say knockout, Tim. That would be terrible. Like this. <laughs> it's, it's a great variety and knockout, by the way, has got some great roses too. Um, Cashmere in Easy Elegance has got just really deep velvety red blooms. It's hardy to the cold climates of zone four, which can be really challenging, but it also has great range into other parts of the country as well. It's clean. Um, it's, it, it's continually flowering. So it's just every time I see it, whether it's in production or in the garden, I'm, I just can't stop looking at it. Okay. Well, it sounds like we have three wonderful recommendations that people should uh, check out if they're wanting to buy some new roses for their garden, which I'm sure after listening to you guys, they will. You've, get, you've given us some great tips and also made, made me realize that roses are a lot easier than what we thought they might be, thanks to all the new breeding work. So, so that's wonderful. Um, as always, our hour goes so fast, but it's been chock full of great information. So thank you to our three panelists, Delilah, Tim, Alec. It was wonderful. We would have you back anytime. So um, just be on the lookout for your emails. <laughs> we might give you a couple months break, but uh, we'd love to have you back. And thank you. And to everyone on the uh, on the webinar, thank you for participating and we're recording it. We'll send it out to everybody who registered and it will also be on our YouTube. So thank you everyone. Have a great weekend. Have a happy 4th of July. Stay cool if it's too hot, but enjoy the weather no matter what it is. Winter will be here soon enough. So get out in your garden and have some fun. And thank you everyone.